The vast majority of these early Fords are monocoque or unibody chassis. That means that each panel that either attaches, bolts on, or is welded together is part of the main body structure. And that's where all the forces are applied. So when you modify one of these early chassis, it's important to understand what impacts different things have, because the last thing you want is a chassis failure. Let's start with by installing an RRS strut front end. Hit it! That's what I'm talking about! Wait! Okay now, from the beginning. Hit it, boys. It's important to note where forces are applied and how they're distributed throughout the vehicle. So the primary weight of the vehicle is in the shocker tower. So this shock tower is extremely bulky, laminated uh, steel panels, and it transfers its weight back into the main bulkhead. So it's carrying its engine weight from there into the shocker tower. Also, the braking forces, to a certain extent, are transferred through here. Your braking force is transferred to here as a pull action, a stabilising point of your lower control arm, but you'll note that the lower control arm is not a weight load-bearing point. The weight is carried through this point. The bottom arm is a guiding point. Any vehicle that has its weight carried on the lower control arm has usually a massive reinforcement structure. As an example, BA to FG Falcons, big K member. EA to EL Falcons, big K member because the load bearing is on the lower control arm. Not so with these chassis, so they're not designed to carry their weight on the lower control arm. It's part of the reason that we haven't used that as any kind of load bearing point. The next thing is where the steering forces are applied. The steering forces are across the widest section of the chassis rail, independent of the weight and braking points. Quite popular is the Mustang II conversion, and I've been asked numerous times why we don't do a Mustang II. Um, there's a whole series of reasons. Uh, the most obvious one, to me, is that it has a negative impact on the chassis. It channels all of the braking forces, all of the weight and load bearing forces, and all of the steering forces into the narrowest part of the chassis rail, just simply not a good idea for longevity. Okay for a drag car, okay for a show car, not good for a car that's going to be punished on the road for a long period of time. Um, you want to be able to carve up corners and this will easily outdo any Mustang II configuration. So, and why chop apart your car unless that's something that you really, really want to do. Um, my view is that even these modifications of notching can be returned back to original uh, if you choose without massive reconstruction of the vehicle. Or alternatively you could just leave the body as original and just bolt the struts, rack and all of these other accessories in. Again it's a modular design so you can leave the original steering if you choose. One of the most common things that I see people make mistakes of our installation is not orienting the top of the strut correctly. This location, as you can see, is not where the big holes are. You've got to drill three holes. It's very important to drill those three holes. While it may bolt in to some existing holes, they're not the correct ones. You have to drill three holes and get the orientation correct. Now, it can't cause a critical failure, but what it will do is spoil the unique handling benefits of the front end. Not in a truly significant way, but it's important that your steering axis inclination is correct. So it has to be symmetrical and drill the three holes in each side. That's the top mounting. Now the other side benefit of using a strut front end, it's reaction time because it's operating on a one-to-one -one ratio with the wheel. So it's a much faster reacting front end than any of the original. Certainly much faster reacting than a Mustang II. So you're going to get better handling from that aspect just by itself. 
Then it's got correct modern steering axis inclination, a unique offset between the spindle, the wheel centre line and the strut leg to create a weight jacking effect. Now what that does is when the car's in a corner, the outside wheel lifts the car up, so it self levels. Uh, and you can only do that with this type of front end. Uh, so we've got that aspect. Then it changes the dynamic loading of this. Because the original had a upper control arm with a much heavier spring because the motion ratio was uh, more than two to one, so that's why it's such a big spring, uh, all of that loading is decreased uh, because it's not l being levered against the middle of the tower. Uh, early Mustangs and early Falcons notorious for cracking these points and having their towers fail. And that's because of the excessive loads on those generated by that format of suspension, which is no longer used in any modern sports vehicle. You'll notice that the 2017-18 Mustang has a strut front end. There's really good reasons for that. I'm just going to send the car up so you can see the struts. Okay, so we've got two major adjustments that you can do with your ride control. <clears throat> we've got spring tension, which affects the height, and you can adjust that. We've also got height adjustment within the clevis leg itself. It's an aluminium clevis to keep the weight down. We had the extrusion dies specially made and dedicated for this because we produce so many of them. But the adjustment is as simple as undoing the lock nuts, removing the set screws, using the RRS spanner provided, undoing that, and with the weight of the vehicle off, you can literally wind the vehicle's height up or down. It also has a camber adjustment on the strut leg itself. Now, because of this, you can fine tune your track, your wheel position in and out by using the factory camber bolt. So that moves the arm in and out, and you've still got enough camber adjustment on the strut leg itself. The knuckle is specially uh, investment cast out of high grade steel, heat treated. We've introduced all brand new uh, and updated quality assurance programs for those particular units so that everything is more accurate than it's ever been before. It uses a bearing hub, so this has more than a 20% load bearing capacity over the original. It also has a platform that is very versatile for lots and lots of different brake combinations. Uh, some people like to use their original wheel woods, bear brakes, uh, Brembo's, all, all sorts, but we have a full range of brakes that are, we think are preferable to some of those combinations. And I'll explain the reasons for that. In a brake caliper, there's some important things to understand of what makes a superior brake. Um, firstly, the amount of venting that is apparent within the brake. So you can see this is a very clear bridge area here. The next part is how much the caliper flexes when it gets hot. So for a street car, the design parameters are a little bit different than a race car. You've got to have factory dust boots, you've got to have a very stiff centre platform, so we've made these out of billet steel and that way this part when it flexes, because a caliper is nothing more than a hydraulic clamp, there's zero flex in here. These are machined piston blocks out of uh, billet aluminium, that way we can maintain the accuracy levels of those. So this is a highly effective street race setup and it's as compact as we could make it. A little bit heavier than uh, some of the calipers on the market because of the steel bridges, but still much lighter than any of the factory combos. The pad surface area and the number of pistons is not as critical as some people think. Um, you can have a four piston caliper like this with an e extremely accurate uh, compression area on the pad. And it's very important that those pads readily accessible so you can get different grades of them which is one of the design features of these calipers and of course different diameter rotors now this brings us to a subject of bigger diameter wheels if you're running bigger diameter wheels 17 18 19 whereas the factory was 14 and 15 
It's very important to increase the diameter of your rotor. The reason is that if you have a small rotor and a larger rolling diameter, your brake efficiency is decreased proportionately to that increase in diameter. A classic is little Hilux trucks, great big uh, wheels on them, wheels and tyres, tiny little brakes and they've lost 15% of their braking capacity. It's not a good idea. If anything, you want to increase your braking capacity. So as you increase in diameter, what happens is you increase your leverage action, mass times distance equals force. You also are more able to modulate the, the pedal because the pad is travelling over a larger distance. This all improves your heat sink, so you get less heat build up in the rotor, more even applied pressure around the rotor. Well, everything that you can make the response time improve adds to the quality of the suspension uh, handling and ride. All of our parts are uniquely five year warranted. This means a lot because you know you've got backup and we're that confident in our components. We've been doing this for a very long time, 15 years of these particular product ranges, refining it, refining it, refining it. That's why we've introduced these things. So why would you go for anything less?